Trigger warning, trigger warning viewers, you've entered a very unsafe space. This is Mark Latham's Outsiders, Australia's most politically incorrect news and current affairs program. We haven't got a list of taboo subjects here. We give you all the stuff without political correctness, without identity politics, without the BS of social engineering. We're not like the ABC where they've got a long list of words you can't say. You can't say mankind. You can't say Negro. You can't say Aborigine. It's gone berserk at the ABC. The things you can't say, they're barely left with anything they can say. So uh, here at Mark Latham's Outsiders, we've got full freedom of speech. Alternative media, full freedom of speech coming to you with Facebook live streaming. And if you can support us, talking of the ABC, we haven't got their billion dollar budget. We haven't got George Soros funding us like GetUp. We rely on your contributions if you can kick the can and help a bit to make sure we uh, defray the costs of the program week by week and keep giving you this format of um, um, PC free information with freedom of speech. Please go to the support page. The uh, address should come up on the screen, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com support.marklathamsoutsiders.com and the other key address of course is the website plenty of great information about all the outsider issues all the important things that you won't see or hear about in the mainstream media and that's www.marklathamsoutsiders.com last week Ben Fordham kindly pointed out you don't need the www that shows showing my age there marklathamsoutsiders.com and for our program this evening it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Daisy Cousins who's come back from Spectator Australia and Quadrant, thanks very much, Daisy. Thank you for having me. And first time on Mark Latham's Outsiders, Claire Lehman from the Rebel Media, yes, and also your website, the Quillette.com, right. which has got a good international following, but we need to build it up here in Australia. Is that right, Claire? That's right, Mark. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Well, that's an absolute, absolute pleasure. And what we want to address at the top of the show this evening, of course, is the important issues about terrorism. We've had the tragedy in Manchester, the massacre there, the lunatic with his uh, nail bomb and um, the you know, hor horrific circumstance of young people at a pop concert, um, so many uh, fatalities and, and injuries, it's just a, a reminder of how dreadful it can be when uh, these uh, radical Islamists uh, cut loose with their evil in a community, in, a, in a, a very civil, unsuspecting setting. And of course today in Australia, in Sydney, we've had the findings of the New South Wales coroner into the uh, Link Cafe siege, the evil of man Monus, the loss of two lives there and, and, and the uh, dreadful disruption to family life for those, uh, those uh, families still grieving for the loss of their loved ones. Um, I think it's very important to have a look at those findings but also to recap on what Cyrus Sarang told us last week on the program. Cyrus Sarang gave a, a stunning interview here on Mark Latham's Outsiders. He was someone who knew Man Monus and tried to blow the whistle to the authorities that this guy was a dangerous would-be terrorist. Thankfully, the coroner has uh, accepted the evidence of Cyrus Sarang to that effect. Let's hear what Cyrus said on the program last week. The important thing for me is, and uh, this person, Man Monas, he was a terrorist, and this was a terrorist activity, and because he came from Iran, and Iranian regime is the mastermind of terrorists around the world. So that's why he came here, and he did this propaganda, changed the religion to ISIS, which nothing to do with that. So Claire, what's the best way of stopping terrorism? Obviously in the case of Man Monas, a, a drifter, um, someone who was uh, alienated from society, very unhappy. He took out his discomfort with the evil of uh, occupying that Link Cafe in Manchester a 22-year-old uh, second generation from a Libyan refugee mm. family. We're getting disturbing reports that this uh, evil guy had moved uh, back to Libya and back to the UK to, through Syria. God knows what the UK authorities were doing. If you monitored his, his travel movements, you'd have some concern about him. He was an oddball in the community. No one grabbed hold of him and uh, the authorities weren't on top of it. We've got these alienated people, a young per person in the UK. What is the solution here? Um, we need integration, we need aggressive assimilation. So what we have at the moment in Western countries all around the world is an influx of migration, but we're embarrassed about our own cultures. So we, uh, we feel this white guilt that we're colonizers, that we should be ashamed for our sins of the past. So we're embarrassed about promoting our values, our cultures, and so Kids growing up, they're, they're not given a model of pride 
And nas nationalism can be quite healthy. I mean, that we know about the dangers of nationalism when it turns into jingoism, but it can be, if, it, if it's uh, done in a critical sort of balanced way, national identity can be really healthy because it brings people together without a, um, a larger identity you can't, having a diverse society leads to tribalism and that's what we're seeing in Europe so there's a, there's a lack of cohesive social trust, social cohesion and you're getting these atomized communities and these enclaves and so no wonder kids are growing up feeling alienated, they're not connected into a national healthy culture. Well we had Mrs A on the program, uh, this courageous former teacher from Punchbowl Primary who said she was threatened by radical Islamic students they had some of the ISIS propaganda available. Uh, they were doing this to her, you know, cut yeah. the throat. Uh, they corralled her in the play, playground and were chanting the Quran at her in Arabic. Are you saying it's very, very important to proudly and aggressively teach Western values, yes. the virtues of Western civilization in our schools, and demand, demand compliance yeah. and acceptance of these values by the Islamic communities? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. No segregation. Women in this country have freedom. No, uh, n no double standards for cultural groups. Uh, we all enjoy freedoms, we all enjoy equ equality of opportunity and we should be proud of that and defend that uh, rather than feeling embarrassed about our own cultures and our own achievements because of history. Well Daisy, there seems to be a pattern that when we talk about is Islamic State, they don't seem to have a, a small army of their activists embedded in Western societies. It's more these um, drifters, uh, Donald Trump has called them losers, people who feel like they're going to find comfort for their problems in evil, the evil of Islamic terrorism. So what, what do we do there? How do you look at Manchester and the, and the findings of the coroner here out of Lint Cafe? What, what do we specifically target here with these people who are targeting us? Well, I think, um, and I've, I've thought this for a while, possibly the most insidious weapon that ISIS has actually is the internet. It is so, so easy for young people, young boys especially, who seem to be their targets to get a hold of ISIS propaganda. You only have to turn to Twitter for crying out loud. I mean, ISIS has Twitter accounts. The more they take them down, the more they put them up. And, you know, email. It is so easy to influence uh, people to behave in this way. And I, th I think we just, we have to be vigilant. We have to be vigilant. I, I agree with Claire when it comes to aggressive assimilation. I don't know why there is such a political correctness issue around this idea of, of wanting Muslims to fully integrate into Western society. I mean, if I, uh, if I moved to China, for instance, I would learn the language, I would learn the customs, and I would happily assimilate because that would make my life easier aside from anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we're so embarrassed about mm. insisting that other cultures, including Muslims, assimilate into our culture. Mm. And if we, if we take care of that and are vigilant, well, we give them a purpose, we give them an identity, and we keep them happy. Isn't the problem, though, the new left narrative about white male privilege? And Claire yeah. touched on yeah. this, the idea that all white men, like myself, are automatically uh, bad people. We've been colonizers, we've been oppressors. We're treating other groups badly. And in the case of Muslims, the leftist argument is they're all oppressed. They're all disadvantaged. They're all suffering. They're all copying it mm. in Western societies. And that creates a narrative where bad behavior is excused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People find excuses, oh, it's mental illness. It's not really their religion. All these problems are excused away. And quite frankly, so many of our politicians fall yeah. for this false narrative. And it's created a softness in the West that you tolerate evil. Effectively, some politicians yeah. are willing to tolerate evil. And some of these celebrities, I think Katy Perry's out there tweeting oh, that, God. tweeting uh, about Manchester that um, uh, a world of no borders, no boundaries, we all need to get along. It's easy for celebrities behind their big walled off mansions to say no borders, no boundaries. Uh, you, you do need a society where people get along, but that's got to be based on common values, yeah. mm -hmm. common cultural acceptance and common acceptable forms of behaviour. So haven't we just become soft because there's been too much accept acceptance of this false narrative, Claire? Uh, I, w I wouldn't say soft, but what we're doing is we're handing this victim identity to people, right? And so people are internalizing the fact that they are victims. And what that does psychologically is when a person starts to feel like they are a victim, they, don't, they feel angry, they feel resentful, they don't feel like helping, they, don't, they feel entitled to be given you know, uh, uh, special advantages. So we're, all of these groups in society, we're handing out this victim identity 
these groups are getting more competitive in demanding victim status and it, it's, it's sort of spiralling out of control and I think the worst example of that is you're seeing these second generation um, kids from Muslim uh, communities, you know, their parents are, have been refugees or migrants and they've grown up in Western countries but they've internalised this sense that they are victims and somehow have been hard done by. Well, I think the other problem is they can grow up in welfare dependent suburbs ethnic enclaves, welfare dependent families and if they're young and they've got problems and they want to take out their frustrations on our society, too much time on their hands can yeah. be an asset to them, sitting around you know, bitching about the government, the Prime Minister, yeah. complaining about everything. Yeah. We've got to have a government that cracks down on welfare dependency in these communities, it goes door to door and says to young people who might be thinking of you know, uh, turning to the dark side, you've got to get a job mm -hmm. and you've got to make a, con a contribution, you've got to be productive mm. and there's nothing better. Uh, than economic activity to focus, you know, the virtues of work as a regular habit in life to get these young people up and running. I don't subscribe to the view that we, we ban this, that and the other thing about Islam, but we should be more demanding of a regular productive contribution to society. Yeah. Daisy? Mm. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I've it, it is so important not to perpetuate the welfare cycle. And again, there's a big sort of PC narrative surrounding this. But being dependent on welfare is never a good thing, especially if, if you are young and you're made to feel marginalised by the white guilt narrative in society. If you have nothing to focus for on, if you feel like you have no sort of purpose and you're not progressing in any way, well, of course it's easy to get on the internet and, and come, into, um, come into contact with, you know, like-minded people who say they support you, who provide you with this, uh, this victim mentality. And that's another purpose, and it's an insidious purpose. So I think it, it is incredibly important, again, to be vigilant and to ditch the political correctness the narrative, ditch the white guilt narrative, and make sure that young Muslims are integrated and are given a purpose. And work is certainly one of the best ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Claire mentioned uh, no segregation. Well, one of the disturbing things we found out in recent times was a report highlighted uh, most graphically on a current affair about the Auburn swimming pool in Sydney. Now, Auburn is a, uh, it's got a large uh, Islamic community. Uh, it's part of central western Sydney, you might say, and it's got a public swimming pool that's now got a petition in place, a curtain, to allow Muslim women to swim in private um, and not uh, be viewed upon by uh, male strangers. It's a form of segregation. One of the great things, one of the great institutions of Australian egalitarianism has been the public swimming pool. Our glorious climate has meant people can have a, an open, affordable environment there where cultures have mixed. We haven't had racial tensions at the public swimming pool. It's a public place available to all until now at Auburn. And I think uh, this is a bad example of the direction in which society is headed that uh, in recognition of so-called minority group victimhood, they're able to petition away, curtain away, shield it away from the rest of the community. It's an end of the tradition of Australian multiculturalism where people are expected to mix together, form friendships, get along together. Let's have a look at how a current affair reported on this. Who would have thought this tiny pool behind these big curtains? Where should curtains be used in normal day life? On your window to stop people perving at you when you've got no gear on. Not in a public swimming pool. Could create such a tidal wave of emotion. What a load of crap. And I think this is a shame. I think it's for the whole community. It's, um, it's a local community pool. At your local pool, you'd expect to find curtains in your changing rooms, right? But here, they've been put up around the entire pool, effectively segregating it from the rest of the aquatic centre, mainly to accommodate female Muslim swimmers. And as you'd expect, that's created more than a few waves. The swimming coach in there was Dick Kane, one of the great Australian Olympic swimming coaches, who's saying this is not on. I find that so disturbing. Uh, it's an example where, let's not mince words here, the council, Cumberland Council, has caved into demands on religious grounds by uh, Muslim women to say, we need a private curtained off area to do our swimming. They should take personal responsibility. If they need the mod modesty measure, they could wear the burkini, for instance. But they're requiring the council to enforce the laws of the Quran, the teachings of the Quran, about the capacity of male strangers to view them and any of their bare flesh. Now, we've had Senator Jackie Lambie banging on about Sharia law in Australia. Where is she on this issue? Where is Senator Jackie Lambie saying, this is an instance of Sharia local government law and regulation 
where the council has enforcing the teachings of the Quran on behalf of those women. Penny Wong recently, Labor Senator Penny Wong made a speech, very strong speech, saying we need separation of church and state. That is no mixing of, um, of uh, religion and government. But clearly, uh, in this instance, it's an overlap of church and state. Wong was saying that in relation to the same-sex marriage issue. She's been totally silent on this. You'd be shocked if Penny Wong had something to say that the council was doing the wrong thing. Claire, you spoke to us about segregation. Isn't this a really, really disturbing trend yep. to segregate off a certain group in the community in a public place? And for the men there, how annoyed are they? If you're a male, you've paid your rates, you've paid to get into the facility at the turnstile, and you're told you can't use the whole facility. It builds up yep. uh, resentment among the groups who are excluded from the identity politics. Not only that, but you're basically telling the men that they're, if they see women's flesh, somehow they're going to be triggered into uh, some kind of sexual harassment. It's a really primitive understanding of the interaction between the sexes and the government authority has no place in enforcing that. I mean, people are free to do what they want in their homes or even private businesses, but asking a council to enforce this is regressive. It's it's a massive step backwards. What, why do you think there hasn't been a bigger outcry? I mean, well, I've actually <coughs> seen feminists defend it. Really? Yeah, I've seen feminists on what online. basis? <laughs> um, I, I've seen feminists, sort of Sydney feminists, saying that it's good that women have safe spaces. Oh God! <laughs> it's but it's just it's just virtue signalling, isn't it? I mean, the hypocrisy of of feminists nowadays is staggering. This shielding women from the male gaze and providing private areas for them to swim is completely contradictory to everything the second wave feminists fought for, which mm. was to sort of abolish the idea of of she asked for it, you know. Oh, and the freedom yeah. to take risks, yeah. the freedom to enter the male world, which can be dangerous, and 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 the freedom to put yourself out there. And, and be an mm. autonomous, self-determining human being. Yeah. But our swimming pools have been so wonderfully free of <laughs> harassment, <laughs> of racial harassment, yeah. sexual harassment. You know, I'm not saying there've been no incidents in the past, but if you had to say, are we a nation where we've provided safe, egalitarian, open swimming pools? We'd say, mm. oh, it's a huge Australian success story. Why go down this path of segregating off? Um, and again, it allows the uh, Muslim women to avoid their individual responsibility. If they've got modesty issues, well, let them take the modesty issues and, and, mm. and find the swimwear that deals with their uh, individual um, yeah. requirements. Yeah. You know? well, what I find most disturbing about it is this, it sort of perpetuates the idea that if a woman does show flesh, then she's somehow asking for it. Yeah. And feminists have fought long and hard to overturn that cultural idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's taken decades. And they've su succeeded. They've succeeded very well. There's a hyper-awareness of that now. You know, the, I the idea of she's asking for it, she was showing too much flesh. Mm. We're very conscious in the mainstream of not perpetuating it. But this is a perfect example of totally regressive thinking. And hypocrisy. A total hypocrisy. Mm. But is it the first example you can think of, sh of Sharia law being enforced by a government authority in Australia? Because that, you know, the council can say, oh, it's for women only, but realistically, this is happening for mi Muslim women according yeah, to the obviously. teachings of the Quran, isn't it? Yeah. I, I find that so disturbing that it's the first instance I can think of of Sharia law, and, you, and it makes you wonder what next. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it does. It absolutely does. I just, I just find it, I mean, I grew up, as I think most Australians did, on the beach, in the water, at, at, public, at public pools, running around in my, in my swim gear as a 10-year-old. The idea of of, of modesty, for instance, would never have entered my head. I have two sisters, would never have entered their heads, n none of my friends, mm. none of that would have even occurred to me. So I find it profoundly disturbing that this is the attitude that's being pushed that little girls yeah, need to and, be modest. And, and the council giving in, this is an example of us, of a Western country being embarrassed about our own culture. Yeah. Our culture is to go to the beach, mm -hmm. is for men and women to swim together, is for girls to be able to not be self-conscious about what they're wearing mm -hmm. and here we are we're too embarrassed we're too ashamed to stick up for our own values so we have to cave into mm -hmm. this uh this this quranic well amazingly in new south wales we've heard nothing from the local government minister we've heard nothing from the premier to condemn any of this it just seems to be drifting along but i can assure you that at mark latham's outsiders we're going to be monitoring this issue i say at auburn pool tear down that curtain <laughs> You know, paraphrasing Ronald Reagan, tear down that curtain. It's just plain wrong. And I don't see how the political system can tolerate this. And, you know, it is possible to petition off a beach. You know, there's this a left-wing council at Waverley that controls Bondi Beach. 
And if Muslim women went there and said, oh, you know, we've got modesty issues down there on the sands of Bondi, it is possible to petition off a beach. Mm -hmm. Now, we know with these leftists there's no limit to their lunacy. <laughs> and I just wonder if, you know, national icons like Bondi, our next one's in the, in the mm. frame for this type of segregation. Well, it actually wouldn't surprise me, and that's, that's the scary thing. A year, a year ago I would be surprised by that, but the, no. it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. I would not put it past them. There's wouldn't no limit to the lunacy. No limit to the and lunacy. And speaking of left lunacy, we've got Julia Baird to talk about. We know at Melbourne University Student Union there was a report last week that, uh, again on the theme, uh, the false narrative of white male privilege, they uh, had a report that said that uh, uh, white men in university tutorials need to speak less frequently. Now, of course, we know in the education system that one of the uh, severe problems, there's Baird's uh, article there, we should stop um, um, uh, taking, uh, the article uh, was headed in the hard copy of the newspaper, is seeking confidence of me mediocre men bad advice. Baird runs the argument that uh, we should stop making mistaking confidence for anything but self-belief. And her argument is supporting the university student union, which said that uh, the white men in the classroom should speak less frequently. And we know in the education system there's a problem where um, adolescent boys get to the age of, uh, say, 11 to 15, they stop reading books, they stop speaking up in class, it's, uh, they're too cool to talk in class. And that's one of the reasons why their school leaving results are not as strong why the university sector actually has 60% female graduates. So the student union and Julia Baird are supporting a system where you look at the universities, men are the minority grouping. Men have got 40% of the university graduates. So the argument at the student union was to say that uh, men should be, the male students should be more like women. If that was true, then uh, they'd have 60% of the graduates. So how crazy is this? It's just, it's insane and it's, it's patronising to men and women, I think, in different ways. And it's, it's, again, it's built on that false narrative. And the thing, the thing about confidence, I guess, this is what they're, they, they push this, they push this argument that women are somehow less confident than men. And you, you can, that has been studied, you can make the argument that women actually apologise a lot more. They say the word sorry a lot more in general parlance and people attribute that immediately to confidence issues but that's not necessarily yeah, true but you can't you can't apply a group average to any individual exactly so, so these sociological or psychological studies that have been conducted they're talking about massive statistical averages mm. so you you if if you know someone is a white male you know nothing about that individual that might be a uh, a white male who, who suffers a language problem, who has mild Asperger's, you know, there, there are a, a huge range of complex variables. And so for Julia Baird to just use this white male privilege as a political cudgel, it's yeah. reckless and it's irresponsible and it's uh, statistically ignorant because she's trying to apply group averages to everybody and, and she's, she's forgetting that there is much greater variation within the sexes than between. So you're going to get confident women, and you're going to get shy men, and you can't just lump everyone in together. Well, Claire, I've got to say, the women in my life and the women I've known in Western Sydney are super confident. You know, if you say <laughs> something wrong, they'll tell you. Obviously, they've got lots of confidence about their career path, about their views, their politics. You know, they're, they're brassy as, and I think that's a fantastic thing. Is it possible that Julia Baird, coming from an upper-class uh, family, the daughter of a lib uh, Liberal federal and state MP, is part of a cohort of oversensitive... Yep. Uh, use the old language, bourgeois, bourgeois women who um, yeah, yeah, feel like they're constantly unable to assert themselves in society? It's this thing where feminism now is the um, purview of middle class women mm -hmm. who want to go back to the Victorian days where women are treated spe like special snowflakes. You know, they, they, need, they want to be deferred to by men. They don't want to enter into the tough world where they have to take risks, where they um, stand up for themselves. Whereas working class women growing up in less safe environments or less uh, coddled environments generally learn how to stand up for themselves. Yeah, they, right? they, they're forced and, to, and the to get job, ahead. The jobs that you take if you're a working class woman, where I, because I grew up in Port Adelaide, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I speak from that point of view. Um, you know, if you're a nurse or if you're working in hospitality or if you're doing a physical job, you don't become precious mm. and you don't, you don't expect authority figures to step in for you to, to protect you, if that makes well, sense. Well, Daisy, you think, know a lot yeah. of young women of your age and around the higher education sector, how would they feel about being 
uh, talk down to this way that they lack confidence and well, a lot of them, a lot of them would agree. They they jump on the victim bandwagon. A lot of my friends w w would agree with that and, and agree with the workshops and um, jump on that opportunity to absolve themselves of any responsibility. They're looking for a free kick. They're looking for, They're a, looking free, for a free, free kick. kick this this whole the idea, system. this whole idea of male privilege, which is demonstrably false for a lot of reasons, is a push by feminists to absolve women of any responsibility for anything that's wrong with their lives. And that is really the crux of modern third wave feminism. It's not about equality anymore. We have that. We know they have, we have that. It's about preferential treatment and female supremacy. And that all ties into the same narrative. Well, I thought Baird was talking down to the average Australian woman. And, and when you look at her uh, research here, she's quoting a study from the British Journal of Psychology to say that um, men regard themselves as much more intelligent than they really are and more so than, than women. But when you actually go to the report at this uh, journal that Baird's relying on to make this generalisation about Australia, it surveyed 31 Australian men, oh. that's all, and 101 women. So less mm. than 150 <laughs> people in total, which is sort of crazy that the sample was so small. And then when you look at the result, there's only a very, very small uh, margin between the men and the women. I think it's just three points over a range of 115. Mm. So for such a small sample, it's statistically insignificant. And the interesting thing further into the report was that when the researchers at this, um, uh, this British journal tried to make a judgment, why is it that men might regard themselves as more intelligent than they really are, much more so than women? Mm. Is it to do with patriarchy? Is it to do with societies where the women have less important roles, uh, they're expected to, to, to mind their place in society. And they tested this and said, oh, well, France is the most feminine of the cultures. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that France actually had the biggest problem. It had the biggest <laughs> yeah, male, yeah. female discrepancy. So the report that Baird is relying on rips apart the patriarchy argument. Mm. Yeah, well, there, there are meaningful psychological differences between the sexes, and I would say that um, Risk-taking is one of those, so confidence is probably overlapping with risk-taking there, but the, the point is that it's, the, the feminist argument is that this is all socialised, so we're, we, we are born and we're, we're socialised, women are socialised to be less confident and men more. Um, but if you look at the literature, the sex differences in things like confidence become larger in countries that are more gender egalitarian. So you'll find more uh, sex differences in personality in countries like Sweden and Denmark and Norway. Why is that? Why is it men yeah. trying to overcome the loss of rights and well, the, the loss of their role in society by becoming falsely assertive? You made a new, this is a fascinating point about the whole patriarchy argument. What you're saying, Claire, is that in societies that might be regarded as gender egalitarian, the male female, female differences uh, get bigger. Get bigger. Mm. Yeah. Well, the, the the theory is that once you level out the playing field and you give people freedom to do what they want, they follow their natural predispositions and their natural inclinations, and that leads to men doing more masculine things and women doing more feminine things stereotypically. Whereas when you're getting into for example, in Iran, there are more women doing computer science in Iran than there are in Sweden. And you can't say that Iran is a gender egalitarian country. So why are women going into that field? Well, there aren't that many options open to them. Mm. And they, they enter into but, computer but science. At the bottom line, the patriarchy argument yeah. and trying to take society in that direction or about white male privilege, it sounds like it's totally futile. People it, will revert to their natural yeah, yeah. disposition. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. So the left feminist cause is doomed to absolute failure, which is good yeah. news. But it, mean, <laughs> it, it, it news. means that our society is being turned upside down for no real purpose. Mm. Well, it's this, it's this push by um, oh. Western feminists to turn women into men for some reason, which, which would seem totally contrary and men into, to... And men into women. And men, and and men, men into, into women. Yeah. They want yeah. everyone to be sort of equally mediocre in, mm. in a funny sort of way. Yeah, it's a, it's a neo-Marxist trying to socially Pac engineer mentality. everyone and control everyone. And the other factor, mm. can I just say, I tried to engage Julia, Bill, but Julia Baird in some of these arguments on Twitter, at my Twitter account at Real Mark Latham. I tried to put these points about the journal and the findings about France and the like. And the only response I got from her, she's someone who's anti-intellectual, anti-debate of any kind, was the, her response was to say I was a bully and engaging in assault. I mean, really, really strange stuff over Twitter to say someone's engaging in assault. She's an example of a couch 
fainting feminist, That's isn't she? The, she's a damsel in distress, poor Julia. If anyone disagrees with her, oh, it's terrible, you say terrible things about it, <laughs> and collapses on the couch. I mean, mm. it, you it's, see that it's you a pathetic form of public presentation. You isn't see it? that all the time, though, with feminists, especially on Twitter. They go on, and there are a couple in particular, they go on and on and on about their misogynistic internet trolls and post screenshots of emails they've received, etc., by men allegedly saying mean things. But, you know, the minute that you sort of, you know, give it back to them on that kind of level, they, 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 they oh, oh my, oh my oh. goodness, my life is terrible, you're insulting me, you're bullying me. Meanwhile, on, on Twitter and other social media, Clementine Ford mm. is dish, dishing out the most vicious, <laughs> consistently yes. uh, Awful. Uh, aggressive stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah. she's immune from any criticism yeah. because she's a woman. Mm. So they sort of say have an equal society, but set up a double standard mm -hmm. whereby Clementine Ford can get away with just about anything Mm. And if a man was to say any of that, it's, oh, you know, straight onto the couch, fainting away. I mean, it just makes a, a proper, structured, uh, truly intelligent debate impossible, doesn't it, Claire? Yeah, and I, I, I've long noticed the tactic is for some of these women to write sort of inflammatory columns. I don't think the bad one was that inflammatory, but certainly Clementine Ford has written some really vile stuff. And you would, the column simply because it's been published online or in the newspaper is somehow not trolling, whereas what people say on the internet is trolling. Mm. So the, these women are given free reign to, to write some really insightful, uh, uh, bigoted stuff, and, um, and as soon as someone disagrees or pushes back, that's, that's mm. then evidence of uh, you yeah. know, male privilege or men being misogynistic or whatever. And, and I think it's a really pathetic tactic to sort of put yourself out there in such an inflammatory way and then when you get criticised sort of then use that as as evidence of sexism. I think it's really Well our cartoonist dishonest. in residence Zeg has had a look at this issue, his first cartoon of the evening. Zeg has had a look at it and produced this cartoon for the benefit of our viewers if we can bring it up on the screen. There's the fellow surrounded by all the uh, feminazis in the university tutorial in <laughs> Melbourne. It's true. If men were more like women, they'd have 60% of the university graduates instead of being a downtrodden minority. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. Not that men complain about it. They're trapped there with all the feminazis. So Zeg has got it 100% correct with his artistic genius. <laughs> and if we can move on to another issue, talking about uh, gender disadvantage, there had been a tradition in the Australian trade union movement to fight very hard for equal pay for equal work. And over the years, has been to the benefit of women. That principle, uh, unions have fought for over 100 years to say if you're doing a certain form of work, the pay should be equal. The Whitlam government legislated equal pay in the 1970s, a very important principle. Well, how's this for a job advertisement? A, a campaign uh, activist has been um, advertised for it. The Labor Council of New South Wales this is the New South Wales equivalent of the ACTU. All the unions in New South Wales are affiliated to the Labor Council there, Unions New South Wales. They're seeking a campaign assistant and you look at the um, pay that's to be provided under superannuation, you find out there's a 9.5% employer contribution, but aha, uh -huh, an extra 2% loading if you're a woman. So the man possibly getting this job hasn't got a great chance, especially if you're a white man at the Labor Council, you get 9.5% super. But a female gets an extra loading. This is sex discrimination institu institutionalised by the Labor Council, Unions New South Wales. What's going on here, Daisy? Female supremacy and special treatment. And that's what they're after and, and that's what they're getting. I mean, it's a, it's a ludicrous policy because it, it's assuming, say, that all women will want to go and, and have children because that's sort of what they're, they're on about. They're saying women are sort of disadvantaged. Maybe they won't spend much time in but the But it's sex workforce. discrimination, it's isn't totally it? It shouldn't, wouldn't it be technical ag technically against the law that yeah, says you, you can't discriminate law. on the basis of gender? Yeah. Where's Kate Jenkins, the uh, sex discrimination commissioner, saying, hang on, you can't pay less to a man than you're paying to a woman mm. well, she's, for the same job. She's, she's suggested that we bring in quotas where um, certain, where government contractors have to be 40% female and 40% male. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This was a few weeks ago. Yeah, and that to me is, is much more outrageous than this superannuation because if you think about the all of the jobs that women dominate in, dominate psychology, nursing, teaching, and if you, if you wanted to make that 40% male, you're going to have to 
tell a lot of motivated, talented, qualified women, sorry, you can't have this job because you're a woman. But Claire, this superannuation thing is a moment in time, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the union movement has fought for equal pay for equal work. And now the Labor Council is basically saying, everyone, you can forget about all that. You know, aren't they effectively saying, well, really, you can go out and pay men and women whatever you like, because that's what they're doing in this advertisement. I think it sets a really bad trend yeah. that could mm -hmm. backfire on, uh, on it, women mm -hmm. in, the, in the labour market. And, and this kind of, these double standards create resentment. So men being paid less will resent the women in their workplace who are being paid more. And that, if anything, is likely to cause sexism mm -hmm. rather than redress it. And I think that's the, the problem that the left has with all of its identity politics. They're well intentioned. They want to, you know, um, fix discrimination or um, compensate for sins of history, whatever. But they're, they're not understanding that once you set up differences and double standards, people become resentful and you cr they're creating what they're trying to fix. Well, uh, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. And today, uh, Corinne Barraclough from Mark Latham's Outsiders contacted the union official in charge of this job advertisement, Salim Barbar, who's the senior campaign uh, fellow there at Unions New South Wales, and he justified it as follows. I think it's quite a remarkable statement. He said, females are obviously more disadvantaged in the workforce. There are greater community needs to have families and so on. Well, it's almost like he's fulfilling the stereotype that women have got to go raise the family and they'll need higher superannuation mm -hmm. later on because they've uh, undertaken the stay-at-home responsibilities. Well, as someone who's been the primary care of my children for a good uh, time now and stay-at-home dad, uh, uh, Mr Mum, whatever I'm called, around the place, um, I don't see how this is a valid way of looking at payment in the workforce, is it? Equal no, pay no, it's not. should Absolutely be the not. principle. And if it's abandoned by Unions New South Wales, everyone should just tear it up. Mm. Mm. Equality of opportunity does not always relate to equality of outcome. And there's nothing wrong with that. that that's how I think society should be uh, structured. Equality of opportunity, equal pay for equal work. And this is not an example of that. No, it's heading in the wrong direction. Yeah. And we're going to now look at the second cartoon that Zeg has uh, submitted to us. It's on a different issue. It's the absurd proposition that came from a former judge in Victoria that we need to change the words of the national anthem. Somehow, believe it or not, there's something offensive about the words young and free. Of course there is. <laughs> Well, Can anyone understand what it is? Young no, but I'm sure it is offensive to someone. He wanted to change the words to "living in harmony." Well, whoopie do that. We're not going to change <laughs> a single word in the national anthem. And That's the a cartoon, terrible lyric. Having a look at the cartoon there, I think it's Egg's greatest work yet. He's got Malcolm Turnbull <laughs> coming across the stage, and the advisor yelling out, uh, "Don't forget, PM, the national anthem is now so inclusive." It has no words at all, <laughs> so don't sing a thing and you'll be right. So well done, Zeg. An absolute ripper for another piece of left lunacy showing it up for what it is. I want to thank you, Claire and Daisy, for your contribution to the panel. Thank you We're much. going to uh, have a short interval. Don't forget our different support pages and uh, website. The support page address is very important online, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. Uh, we're going to thank uh, Daisy and Claire for their wonderful contribution and after this uh, video clip we're going to talk to Emma Eros who has a wonderful story to tell. We're going to play the sad news out of Manchester because I want to ask Emma as a practicing Muslim what she thinks about the terrible thing that happened in that British uh, city. So uh, we'll have a look at this clip and come back with the amazing Emma Eros in a short while. We begin tonight with breaking news. There has been a deadly explosion tonight at an arena in Manchester, England, where the American pop star Ariana Grande had been performing. Jonathan Vigliani is in our London newsroom with the breaking news. John? And Scott, we're getting new details at this hour. Police are now confirming there are a number of fatalities and other injuries. There are also reports of two loud bangs going off inside the Manchester Arena, one of the largest arenas in Europe. Video posted on social media shows people running to escape from the arena and a lot of commotion. Reports say a concert by pop star Ariana Grande had just concluded when observers said they heard what they characterized as explosions. Police told people on social media to stay away from the area. Police cars, ambulances, and riot vans were seen outside the arena and the complex's train station was shut down. One person who posted video on Twitter said people were running out with blood on their clothing. 
Again, very few details at this hour. Scott, we will keep watching the situation. So a massive police operation underway in Manchester, England. We're told that Ariana Grande herself is safe, but there have been multiple fatalities. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Emma Eros to uh, our show this evening. Mark Latham's Outsiders. Emma, welcome. Great to have you, you here. You've got an me. amazing story. A young woman, a mother. I am. A practicing Muslim. I am Muslim, yes. Yeah, and uh, a, a registered trader. You work as a plumber. It's an I amazing am. story. I am. I'm a mother. I'm 38, and I have beautiful two children, married to an Australian Aussie fella. Supporting, I may say, and I have beautiful two stepdaughters, and yes, I am a licensed female plumber. Well, that's amazing stuff. What is your reaction as a Muslim to what happened in Manchester? <sighs> Look, I condemn the action, and my s s deepest condolences go out to all family and friends that are affected by this. This is wrong. It's just an inhumane act. It should not have happened. It should never happen. Things like that should have got to stop, and we need to do something about it. Everybody needs to do something about it. What is the solution? I know you're very strong on the immigration issue, border control. How important is that? Well, look, you know, in the 60s, yes, immigration was great. There was no welfare then. People came, they generally came to change their life and make better of it, and they did. They worked, they simulated, they integrated, and it was great. But I suppose having this welfare system and, you know, we have a lot of fraud and fake Australians coming into this country, and I suppose freeloading from our system and then it's got to stop we need to do something about it and if our government will not do a moratorium or have a referendum and allow the people to decide that decision then they need to well they have an opportunity to create positive revenue where anyone that comes into this country any money given to them paid back like a hex like system you know and if they don't learn the language and they've got a set amount of time well see you later well, David Lionhelm, the uh, Liberal Democrat senator, recently revealed that in Australia, every year, for in non-citizen welfare, these are people who are citizens of other countries but living in Australia, we pay $15 billion a year. That's it's right. an extraordinary amount, $15 well, billion. Well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't work my ass off to look after my family, to pay a shitload of tax, excuse my French. No, that's all right. So, my, my government speak frankly here? My government can go and distribute it to those people who do not deserve it. They're, we have a you know, homeless people that need to be looked after. We have a list of people that need, require housing that need a home, somewhere to live in. We have, uh, gosh, just veterans that need to be looked after. Doesn't charity start at home? At what point, what do we need to do? Do we not pay our taxes for this to, you know, maybe well, we shouldn't? Well, the problem of fake refugees and the welfare bill, we've had some progress. Uh, one of the issues that was raised last Wednesday night here on the program was Cyrus Sarang saying he thought there were up to 6,000 fake Iranian refugees in Australia. And thankfully, Immigration Minister Peter Dutton has listened to Cyrus Sarang and made an announcement on Sunday to say that he'll be cutting off the welfare for 7,500 uh, refugees, would be fakers, mm -hmm. who have come into Australia under the boat people policies of Rudd and Gillard governments. And if they don't provide their documents and uh, answer questions about their identity, they'll be deported. So let's have a listen to what Cyrus Sarang said on the program just last Wednesday. Go to from 2000 and open up the file who has visited the Iran and you look at the file, are they refugees? They applied for refugees or not? Are we talking about dozens, scores, hundreds? Uh, maybe more, dozens. I, I, dozens? I can say maybe it's uh, three to six thousand. Three to six thousand yes, sir. fake Iranian refugees yes. in Australia. Yes, they have wow. to open up the file and they have to see these people have visited They've been Iran. back. They've been back safely. Yeah. It well, it's a credit to Cyrus Sarang that he raised that issue and uh, more so a credit to the minister that he's taking action about. Isn't this the sort of tough policy we need, Emma, to sort out these problems? I mean, these are people who've thrown their documents overboard. They're paid people smugglers. They've come into Australia under bad Rudd-Gillard policies and all these years later, they still haven't substantiated who they are. Uh, I mean, there's an argument to say the minister should have got tough a while ago, shouldn't yep, he? and we're bringing in another 24,000, is it? Well, Syrian refugees, a big intake. I think yeah. it's uh, 12,000, well, maybe know, more. Why isn't Saudi Arabia or the other Ara Arabian countries surrounding these gold oil mine uh, tycoons not taking them in? It will be easier if they help these, you know, refugees, take them in. They will be able to 
uh, integrate very easily because they speak the language or already. They are used to the surroundings. And I just, I don't know, one has to ask the question, why haven't they taken them in? Well, let's also talk about your personal background because you've got very strong views. Uh, you're obviously not a radical lefty. No, absolutely Which not. is uh, refreshing. You're not Yasmin abdel Magid. No. So obviously you don't get on the ABC no. uh, where they only have uh, lefties. And I think uh, Yasmin Magid gives um, uh, Islamic women a bad name. Well, she represents the... her, her little sector. So how did, how did you uh, get in, into the plumbing trade? Uh, okay, well, originally I, had, I did have a plumbing supply with my partner and we just, from going from there, we started our own construction and I was about to go get my MBA in business and he said to me, look, you know everything about plumbing, why don't you try it? And I did. I started running the construction sites and I did it. I got my license and I say we put the organs in construction. And how's it gone for you? I love uh, it. You know, I we hear all this snowflake. I talk love it. I mean, of course. That women can't oh, cut no. it in the workplace. A building site must be a pretty oh, rough look. and ready place at times. How have you found I, it? I encourage all women to go out and get into the trade industry because I tell you right now, if you're whinging about your pay, you'll make just as much money and more even in the trade industry. So you found no problem there no, of discrimination? No. You oh, held your I own did. with the language oh. and the banter? Yeah, look, I did. I, initially, when I first started, you do get your chauvinist men who actually weren't Austra Australians to start off with and who couldn't handle a female in the industry. And But you know what? But it was more their problem than it yours. Was, you were it cutting was it okay. because, because I wouldn't hire them and they lost their contract and I never had that problem ever again. So it was great for <laughs> me. Yeah. And um, you'd urge other women to get I out do. And, I encourage. And, and check out Why the trades? Why not? Give it a go. Give it a go. Don't be scared. And I must say, yes, I'm a plumber, but I have never touched anything disgusting <laughs> because we do it from ground up and it's all clean. So all this left feminist talk, we mentioned Julia Baird earlier on, you know, a, a, a couch fainting feminist, the real snowflake. People can't say anything negative without her falling to pieces. Yeah. How do you tr you treat that with contempt? Do you think it's I sort think of it's a, 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 a betrayal of the interests of women? Well, I think she's managed to have a little following of women that have the same idea, but it is an excuse. And I don't know. I I, I can't. I just think maybe they need some medication and just suck it up, princess. Right. Well, that's yeah. pretty good advice. And politically, you'd describe yourself as a conservative. You know, I have got, if I may say, I have a website. It's Emma Eros for a Smarter Australia. And in my opinion, there are policies, because we do lack policies that are for the best interest of this country, our the betterment of Australia, full stop. And, um, you know, I encourage people to check it out. There are great ideas there. And if you've got a few that can be fantastic, you know, and you've got great ideas, well, you know, send me an email. Let us know. Interact. We need to do something about this. We need to fix our country because right now we've got incompetent, you know, ministers and public servants who aren't doing their job as far as I'm concerned. And we need a change. We need decent, smart people in politics or back in politics, Mark. Well, one of the reasons I got you on the show is I heard your story and I thought we hear so much of this Yasmin abdel Magid. She had a background in engineering. I think she worked on oil rigs and... Uh, she's young, she's got the col colourful clothing and all that, Islamic background. She's been promoted on the ABC and SBS as the young, vibrant female face of Australian Islam. Right. And we know that she's run all sorts of crazy things, the, 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 the offensive comments on Anzac Day, this theory of cultural appropriation she runs, which is really a form of segregation. You know, I really, really hope that um, different media outlets hear what you've got to say this evening and understand that you're more representative of Thank that you. particular group, aren't you? I mean, among Thank young you. Muslim Look, women, how much affinity would there be for this lefty radical Yasmin? Aren't your views more the mainstream? You would think so, but, you know, you've got the left probably think otherwise. I well, mean, for me, I would like to say, if, if I may, I encourage all parents and guardians to go out of your little bubble that you're in, 
get out and integrate. Go and volunteer your time. If you are on benefits and welfare, volunteer your time. There is amazing organisations that require some assistance. Go out to nursing homes, schools, you know. Maybe there's a little old lady down the road that requires her lawns to be mowed. Go and help. Show who you are as a person. Nobody needs to know your faith, your belief. You can do that in your own four walls. Go out there and just show who you are. If you want respect and you really want to go, you know, you've come to a better country with democracy, then show your appreciation because people like myself do not want to be paying for, for freeloaders. Bottom, full stop. We just don't want to do it anymore. We've well, had enough. Well, that's right at the mainstream. So that, that your message to the Muslim community is all about integration. It is. Go Accept out the there. Accept the Australian values, make absolutely. a productive contribution, get stuck absolutely. in, just as you have. Yeah, absolutely. My family came here in the 60s. They worked. There was no welfare. They worked. They did their bit. They integrated. They loved Australia. Go out and travel because I tell you, you will find it amazing. You may just find a career in something you volunteer your time in. Well, that's a very powerful message. I think we should send a memo out to the ABC and SBS that it's women like Emma who should have a platform uh, at the public broadcasters to say those things. I want to thank you, Emma, for coming in. I Thanks, hope you Mark. come back to Mark Latham's Outsiders. We want to give you as thank much you. coverage as possible because your message is much more beneficial to our nation than the likes of Yasmin abdel Magid. I think she's got a uh, mutant, radical leftist position that's totally unrepresentative of where Australia should be headed. She's proven that publicly, and the ABC would be wise to take you on board as the voice of that community instead of... Uh, these radical lefties who are sending us backwards. But the other point I've got to uh, raise updating our show last week, we had Ben Fordham here who put out the challenge about pie facing. One of the things we've loved to show is the Alan Joyce pie facing. Here it is, just as a reminder what happened to little Joycey in Perth. Heck. I don't know what that was about. Excuse me, uh, I might take a break for a second, guys, and just clean up a little bit. Well, I've been CEO of Qantas now for, for close to nine years, and it was a new experience. I'm here to announce the... Oh. Oh. <laughs> f***ing heck. I'm here to announce the... Oh. Oh. <laughs> f***ing heck. Well, you've got to love it. No matter how many times you see it, it's very, very funny. Mm -hmm. And we've got a little announcement to make in a short time. But one of the things I should have mentioned when Daisy Cousins was here, she's promoting the Red Pill at George Street Event Cinemas, the 21st of June, 6.30 p.m. Tickets must be booked by the 9th of June or the screening won't happen. We're supporting the Red Pill. It's a very, very instructive documentary. There should be no censorship about it. It's not outlandish. It's not over the top. It's regular debate. She's raising funds, uh, Daisy, to her credit, for Dads in Distress organisation, fan-force.com, and Daisy's Facebook page has a link at the top. So support the Red Pill, support Daisy, support Dads in Distress. That's an announcement we should have made when Daisy was here. It's a very, very worthwhile cause. So anyone who's watching this evening, support Daisy Cousins, what she's doing, a very important uh, cause there, and fundraising. But the Red Pill, you need to see it at uh, the event cinemas on the 21st of June at 6.30. Now, we had there... Alan Joyce and the, um, the uh, pie-facing. Little Joycey overreacted totally by pressing charges against that gentleman in Perth and actually banning him from all Qantas, Jetstar and Emirates flights. The poor 67-year-old, uh, if he was banned at Virgin, he'd have to walk across the Nullarbor to try and get around our vast country. Now, Ben Fordham said anyone who donated $500 to Mark Latham's Outsiders could have a pie-facing. Now, the first donation that came in from Roger Jenkins was actually directed at Ben Fordham. It said that Ben hadn't been supportive enough on a certain issue and Roger wanted Ben to cop the pie. I said this to Ben Fordham, he hasn't turned up tonight. Not surprisingly, he's done for cover. But unfortunately, another donation has come in. You're aware of that, I Emma? I am. I've got and you've actually got the pie there. $500 has been contributed to Mark Latham's Outsiders. So... Are you ready? Don't sue me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> No, I'm not going to press charges against them. I didn't expect it to be oh that. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Awesome. No, 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 don't be sorry. I've made a big song and dance about this. I had to cop it. There's a whole bunch of lefties out there who'd love to do it. But I want to thank the outsiders. I'm not pressing charges. I don't even own it or run an airline, so I can't ban anyone from anything. But in politics, you've dished it out, and I, we've given it to Joycey over the time. You've got to cop a bit back. 
I've got to say, the cream is quite good. You should just <laughs> not only suck it up, lick it up, and get on with your business, Alan Joyce, and not worry about it. I'm not pressing charges. I'm not ringing the police. Just because I've, I've copped a lot in politics, never the cream pie. But there you go. You've got to cop the whole box and dice over time. Thanks, Emma. Thank not you. Not for the pie and the press, <laughs> but for being on the show and making such a great, Thank you important for contribution. Me. Thanks to our viewers, and we'll see you next week, 8 p.m. for Mark Latham's Outside. We'll take you out with a video about what's gone wrong in the education system. It's a spooky portrayal of all the wretched identity politics and crazy PC in education. And I hope you enjoy this, and uh, I'll get back to licking my pie and enjoying it. We'll see you next uh, week. Thanks for viewing. Well done, Simon. Next question. What is three times three? Yes? Nine. Wrong. Yes, Penelope. Gender equality. Very good, Penelope. Is this a joke? Do you think gender equality is a joke? No, but isn't this a maths class? Don't be so racist. I just asked a question. We don't ask questions. Questions are offensive. Yeah! Now, students, I trust you've all completed your research assignments. And remember, the person with the highest mark will be flying to New York to present their paper at the World Mathematics Summit. Well done, Penelope. Six out of ten. You too, Simon. Six out of ten. Hey. Be careful. You've been staring at her for 10 seconds. What? It's a form of harassment to stare at a woman for more than 15 seconds straight. And when I use the term straight, I don't mean to offend any persons of a non-traditional sexual preference. And when I use the term non-traditional, I don't mean to offend any persons who oppose historically normalised... Okay, okay, I get it. Unfortunately, Sunshine, your research assignment is only worth a 1 out of 10. I've used Fourier transform and mathematical methods in electronics to analyze the electrodiagrams of at-risk patients and calculate their risk of experiencing a heart attack. I mean, it's a new method, but it could potentially save thousands of lives. Seven. You barely even read it. You used red pen. What? Red is considered defensive in many religions. Why would you belittle everything down to a singular color? Well, humanity is a rainbow of beauty and spirituality. Yeah. Okay, fine. Seven out of ten. But that still means I get to go to the summit, right? The marking process isn't over yet. Now, because we live in a society based on equality, the total amount of marks are to be divided equally among our students. You've got to be kidding me. Well done, students. We're all equal. We're all average. Yay! But then who gets to go to the summit? Oh, we haven't added our privilege points yet. Don't you know anything? That is correct. Now, Penelope, you are female, so that's plus one privilege point. However, you are white, so that's minus one. But I'm also bisexual. Plus one. That leaves you with a total score of six out of ten. Simon, unfortunately, you're straight, white, and male. And cisgender. Yes, so that's minus four privilege points, 
which leaves you with a total score of one. It's only fair. Now you. You're male, and I don't like you. So that's minus two privilege points. But you are brown and sexually ambiguous. So that's plus two. That leaves you with a total score of five. Wait, why am I sexually ambiguous? And finally, Sunshine. Um, I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm Asian. <laughs> I'm overweight, I'm lower class, I'm unintelligent, unattractive. I've got hairs on my nipples, and I also got body odour, and I can't really run properly or tie my shoelaces by myself. And I once watched a pigeon die. Wonderful sunshine. That's 13 privilege points. That leaves you with a total score of 18 out of 10. Well done, sunshine. You're going to New York. Hooray, sunshine! We knew you could do it! Let me see this. They've just written equality and drawn love hearts on a piece of paper. He expressed himself and it's beautiful. He didn't even spell equality correctly. We don't discriminate. This has nothing to do with mathematics. Do you think you're so great with your maths and your science and your facts? What about feelings, huh? Yeah. Feelings are more important than facts. Yeah! This is wrong. You're all crazy. <sighs> Stop violating me with your different opinions! I have the right to speak my mind! No, we have the right not to be offended. And that's more important. And if you don't stop verbally assaulting us, we will be forced to attack you in self-defense. Can't do that. Actually, we have every right to do so. And it's illegal for you to fight back. Yeah! This is insane. Prepare to die a noble social justice warrior. Death! <laughs> Welcome. Ignore that. It will end. <laughs>